So I'm Mikael Linden from the Finnish Elixir Node, and I'm the co-leader of the Elixir AI task. The content of the webinar is here. So I'll first introduce the goal of the presentation and then provide an overview of the Elixir AI services and then show how access rights to sensitive data sets can be applied using Elixir AI, how Elixir AI can deliver the permissions to access the data sets to the environment where the access rights are used, and then how um, the actual data can be accessed in that environment. Finally, I'll introduce some of the future work. So Elixir AI is the Elixir Compute Platform Service for authenticating researchers and assisting the services that rely on Elixir AI to decide what the authenticated users are permitted to do in the service. The service itself has been in production since November uh, 2016, and the link to the to more information is, is in, in the slide. So the goal of this presentation is to show how researchers can use Elixir AI to apply for and receive access rights to sensitive data sets and how the data sets can be actually processed in a secure computing environment. This is the overview of Elixir AI service. Down here are the places where the researchers are authenticated. We prefer the researchers to use the home university or research institutions, authentication provider and local accounts via the giant operated Edugain interfederation service. So the research could use the credentials the home organization has provided to them for logging in. But we also support commercial alternatives like Google and um, community services like Orchid. Here in the middle is the Elixir AI service. I will soon return to it. And up here are the relying services, those Elixir services that make use of, make use of Elixir AI for authentication and authorization. Some of the services are simple services like Elixir Internet, which many of you are probably familiar with, or e-learning services. But there are also some more complex services like EGA, that is the European Genome Phenome Archive for Sensitive Human Data and IAAS cloud environments like the CSC POTA environment where the data sets from EGA and other data archives are eventually processed. And this presentation will focus on these two relying services. So when the user has authenticated using, for instance, the home organization credentials, they land on the Elixir proxy IDP, which, which decorates the authenticated users with extra attributes that Elixir AI manages for the researchers, and then passes the researcher to the relying services, potentially using of authentication if the relying service requires that and also translation of the of re researchers' credentials, for instance, to X509 certificates. In this particular scenario, um, Elixir AAI manages the permissions, the researchers' permissions to data sets in EGA. And for that purpose, Elixir AAI has an extra service for dataset authorization management, which is based on the REM software. 
and the REM software logic is explained here. We have research groups led by a PI and we have data sets and the data sets are controlled by data access committees or other persons or bodies that can speak for them and decide who's authorized to access the data sets. So we have metadata on the data sets. The metadata is imported to this REM system, which has authentication based on Elixir AI. So both the PI and the DAC members can use Elixir AI to authenticate to REMS. The PI logs in to REMS via Elixir AI, fills in an electronic data access application and identifies the data sets they are interested and attaches whatever reasoning needed for the data access application, for instance, at the JSON research plan that is relevant for the data access application. The REM software then asks the research group members to commit to the license terms of the data sets and circulates the um, data access application to the data access committee. The data access committee can approve the data access application or return it to the applicant for re refinements or reject the application. And if the application is approved, the members of the research group can actually access the data sets in the environment where, where the data sets are processed, which in the context of this webinar is the IAAS cloud environment. And I have a demo which I'm going to show to you. This demo instance is a completely public demo instance which has public accounts and imaginary data sets. So you can really um, give a try at home and play around with this demo installation. So I will open the demo in a private browser window. Can you still see it? Yes, I go. Good. So I log in and I use one of the public user accounts. RD up Applicant one and the password is actually the same as the username. And now I'm logged in as an applicant to this demo environment. I select, well, that you can see five data sets there. And in this demo, the name of the data set it actually refers to, to um, language archive REM system is used beyond life sciences as well and these demo data sets refer to the Finnish language bank which uses REMS as well but in the context of this demo what is relevant is that the name of the data sets also describes the approval process for the um, data access applications I select this Alpha Corpus, which has one approval, which means that a single person is able to approve the data access applications. There are also other kind of workflows for approvals. For instance, two different persons or DAC members need to approve the um, data access applications for some other data sets. So I click Apply, 
and the electronic application is open for me. My name is prefilled. It's this test, test account, and this is the data set I'm applying for. And here I fill the name of the project. and the duration of the project and purpose of the project. The application of the data set is, is completely um, customized and can be completely customized. There can be any kind of um, fields or buttons in the application. You can also the dataset owner can also decide that for the dataset, the researcher needs to attach a research plan as PDF, for instance. And here are the terms of use to which I need to commit. And for, for this dataset, um, the dataset owner has defined that I need to commit to um, CC attribution. Um, license terms and general terms of use, which is just some example text in in this. So I check the checkboxes. I have committed to license terms, and I sent the application. And now, REM system has circulated the application to the data access committee for approval. And as applicant, I have now, um, I'm now done, and I can log out. So I close the private browser window and open a new browser window to demonstrate how to log into REMS as the approval. I log in and I use the demo account in the context of Elixir I wouldn't of course use demo account but use my Elixir AI identity to log in and, and the DAC members would use the Elixir IDs as well And now I have logged into REMS as the DAC member. And I can see a couple of data access applications there. Some of them are a bit older, but the last one is the application I just submitted. I can view the application. Okay, person called RD applicant one has filled the application. There are some more information on them. And they have applied for access rights to this data set. And that's the ap application um, text name, the duration of the project, and, and the purpose of the project, and the list of terms of use the applicant has applied for. I can provide comments on this application. And then can, I can reject or return the application or approve it. And in the context of this um, demo data set, one approval is sufficient so now the user interface signals that the data access application has been approved and the applicant can start to make use of the access rights. If there were several uh, persons that needed to approve the data access application, 
this application would have been circulated to them for approval, but in this case, there was not. So now if I log in again as the applicant, um, REM system will show that my application has been approved. But for the interest of time, I think I, I will skip that now. But this instance is public, completely public, and the list of usernames and passwords for this demo are available in the front page of the service. So please give a try at home. And that was the end of my part in the presentation. So I'm now handing over to Juha Turnroos, who will um, describe how the permissions can be used in the compute environment at CSC. Thanks, Mikael. I'm going to share my screen and continue the presentation. So now we have granted access to a data set. So let's see how these permissions can be delivered to the cloud environment and how user can use the data set. And um, here you can see the overall setup. On the left hand side, we have cloud and virtual machines. Next to that, there's a staging area which is connected to the cloud and the data to this comes from ETA. So this is your data from ETA. And on the right hand side, there's a REMS and permission information is stored from REMS to ETA. I'm going to use ETA as an example here, but we have also thought that how this can be done without um, external service, so so REMS can be connected directly to uh, Elixir AI. So now we are focusing on this red circle, how to use permission information to authorize the data use in cloud environment. In the example which is going to show, this is um, CSC's ePoto Cloud. And um, now the question is that um, how to deliver this permission information from ETA to the cloud. And this is something what happens via Elixir AI. To do this, we have developed an API called um, Permissions API. And um, here you can see how it works. On the right hand side, we have permission sources such as ETA or RMS directly, as I mentioned. We are going to uh, focus on, on uh, ETA and uh, I'm going to uh, explain how, how that terms can be used directly later on. But in this picture, you can see that permission sources uh, uh, or one of the permission sources is ETA and the other one can be RMS. In the middle, uh, there's Elixir AI, which delivers permission information to the service consuming this information. So here's the services. And in the middle, there's Elixir AI. How this works in practice? The service needing this information requests, requests a token from Elixir AI, which then makes a request to permission source. Elixir AI encapsulates this information into the token and hands this token to the, to the service originally requesting this information. So what is this token which is handed by Elixir AI to the service? It's um, standard OAuth 2 access token, which format is JVT, JSON web token. It contains header and payload and signature. 
and there contains um, encoding information and token type. Payload contains uh, issuer, so who issued this token, expiration date, um, subject information, and possibly some additional information. And actually, this additional information in this solution we have designed is uh, the dataset permissions. And then um, naturally, signature contains digital signature for the token. Here is an example what this token looks like. On the left is the encoded format, and on the right side, there's the coded format. So here is the header, and after the header, there's a pay payload. And um, you can see that um, it's issued by Elixir AI. It has some expiration, and um, then there is this. Um, permission list, ETA permissions. And um, inside that, there's actually a list of data sets which this token can or have access to. So now we have a mechanism for delivering data permissions to the consuming service. So how to use this information? Um, one of these um, uh, ser services which can consume this information is ETA Data API. And the API is developed to provide secure access to genomic data sets. And it supports uh, functionalities like decryption on the fly, authentication and authorization using OAuth 2 access tokens. This is um, obviously one of the key things here. And it also supports um, Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, HTS get streaming protocol, and Fuse file system. Fuse refers to file system in user, user space. So this in practice means that the um, user can see data sets as some regular files in the file system. And uh, Data API is developed by EMBL API together with CSC and local ETA development team. So, what is the information flow from user perspective? Um, in this picture, the, the whole flow is described. Uh, and on the right side, there is a virtual machine. And in, inside that virtual machine, there is a software called the OA2 Client Initiative. And um, it is going to manage the tokens. And below that, there is a Fuse client, which is basically a client to that uh, ETA Data API. It is going to provide the Fuse file system, which I mentioned. And um, Cloud, cloud provider, provider is also going to um, host uh, OA2 client software. I will explain in a minute what, what, what is that for. And um, then we need a user and user's web browser. And um, on the left, there is Elixir AI and ETA permissions. So basically the permissions API hosted by ETA. And the flow starts from the virtual machine. The software running in that virtual machine is going to uh, create a uh, unique uh, key, and it's going to um, tell that key to, to OA2 client running by the cloud provider and that um, OA2 client in, in that virtual machine is uh, also going to generate a URL which contains that uh, unique key and it's going to tell that the URL to user and user is going to go to that URL using his or 
our the browser. And uh, the software running in virtual machine is pulling the OA to client and asking that, um, do you have access token for me? And uh, this is happening until there is a valid token. And what happens after that is basically uh, open ID connect uh, standard based authorization code flow. So user goes to that URL and that URL is in, in that OAuth to client and that client is going to redirect user to Elixir AI. And um, Elixir AI is going to, um, well, then user authenticates him or herself in, in Elixir AI. And when that authentication is done, Elixir AI is going to redirect user back to this OAuth to client. And then OAuth to client is going to ask from Elixir AI that what um, data set permissions do you have for this user? And Elixir AI is going to make this request to EGA permissions API. And when Elixir AI gets this information, it's going to return access token to OAuth to client and eventually that virtual machine uh, is going to receive this token. And in that virtual machine, user can use this token to fuse client, and fuse client will pass this token to ETA Data API, and ETA Data API can then provide access to that data. And um, I have recorded a video how this works in practice. So at first, user is going to take SSH um, connection to EPO to VM virtual machine. We assume that the um, user already have a virtual machine in EPO to cloud. And when user uh, logins to that virtual machine, uh, the, the virtual machine is going to print that URL to user. So before a user can actually do anything, user um, can need to copy paste this URL into the web browser. And uh, I'm going to also use private browsing mode here because Elixir AI is single sign-on service. So otherwise, um, I don't need to log in at all. So at first, I need to select my home organization, which in my case is CSC. And then I'm going to log in. And then, then I'm going to be redirected back to that OAuth to client service. And in the meanwhile, that virtual machine actually got that access token. So it's now stored in that, in that virtual machine. And then virtual machine automatically mounted that fuse file system. So all the data what I have access to in ETA is now accessible in that virtual machine. I have a dataset directory there, and then um, I have access to three ETA datasets, and I can see them as a regular files. So, for example, this file is uh, GitHub compressed data. It's a BAM file, and um, I can read it. So here is the BAM file header. And um, if I scroll down, I will see the content. So this data is archived, uh, encrypted, and um, decryption happens on the fly. 
and I read this while it's decrypted. And back to the presentation. Something about the future work. Um, as I mentioned, this um, presented model, the model which we have designed is um, very general. It's based on standards and um, it uh, enables the use of data permissions by any of relying service, Elixir AI relying service. So if um, you are supporting Elixir AI in your service, you are most likely already using access tokens and so you just need to enable support for this and and uh, fetch the information, data permission information from these tokens. And um, one of the uh, future work is um, implementing support for permissions, permission API directly to REMS. Uh, we demonstrated um, how this works with ETA, but we are also implementing for directly to REMS. So it is possible to use um, this with any data sets, uh, whatever they are part of ETA or not. And uh, the need for this um, permission information is identified at least in local ETA project. And um, in implementation study, which is about um, global alliance for genomics and health um, cloud um, standards and um, RD Connect platform. And um, I guess that then we are in the final section. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. This um, work is something what is um, done by uh, Mikael Linden and I, and uh, Alexander Sen has been responsible for ETA Data API part, and uh, Martin Kupa has uh, uh, done the Elixir AI authorization server part, and then uh, Tom Mijalhan and Timo Mustan are responsible for REMS software, and of course we have got lots of support from the whole Elixir human data community and AI people.